everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Got my remote campuses, everyone? Okay, before you started, let me just say that those of you who didn't get the packet um, or it wasn't emailed, you can download it right from my website at any time. Um, you can download all the worksheets. All right, so let's get started. So my name is Barbie Honeycutt. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, today, I'm gonna put you to work. All right, I practice what I teach. I flip everything I do. So we're gonna flip this faculty development workshop. I'm hoping that by the time you leave here, you will have completed a flipped lesson plan from start to finish, and you'll have a lot of new teaching strategies you can use in your classrooms, all right? So the first thing I'd like you to do is I'd like you to work with a partner, just turn, and I'd like you to brainstorm. What do you think are some characteristics of the flipped classroom? Just brainstorm. And you can write it on your workbook page on the very first page. Okay, has everybody had a chance to brainstorm? All right. Throw me some of your uh, characteristics out. Everybody just yell some of them for me. Engagement. Engagement. Okay. What else? Good. Content presentation is outside of the lecture hall. Okay. So content presentation is outside of the lecture hall. Okay. Good. What else? Problem solving inside the lecture hall. Problem solving inside the lecture hall. All right. So if you're moving content out, something has to come in. Okay. Good. What else? Not everybody at once. <laughs> Come Students coming to class prepared, we hope. All right, good. Okay, what else? Lots of interaction between the students in the, at the time in class. Okay, so during class, lots of interactions between students, um, and could be more interaction between you and students. Exactly. So, okay, good. All right, give me one more. That's quiet. You have to be motivated. They do have to be motivated. They have to be motivated to do some of that work outside of class so they can come in class and be prepared to, to do the activities or the readings or the discussions. Excellent. All right, I just want to get a feel for what you think the flat, flipped classroom might be uh, because I'm coming at you from a different perspective. I've expanded on the model of what the flipped classroom is, and I'm hoping today that it will give you a lot of different ideas for ways you can flip your classroom. Basically, it's all about flipping that energy in the classroom from being teacher-centered to being student-centered. And it sounds like you're all on the same page, so I'm in the right place. All right, so what we're gonna do today, we're gonna actually create an engaging learning environment by flipping a lesson. You're actually gonna think about one lesson that you wanna flip. One of the best things you can do, because it can be so overwhelming to think about this whole thing about I have to redesign my whole course, I have to start from scratch, you do not. I just want you to think about one lesson. And that's what we're gonna play with today. I'm gonna come around and help as many of you as I can kind of brainstorm and think about this, all right? So here's our learning outcomes. We're gonna analyze some of the current research and models about the flipped classroom. We are gonna identify what I call flippable moments. We're gonna design, or maybe you wanna redesign a lesson. If it's not working really well, maybe it's something you wanna to try to just kinda of tweak a little bit. Today's the day to play with it. We're gonna share best practices and then think about some resources for your professional development to continue beyond this workshop today. All right, so let's go. We're gonna analyze definitions and models, and for those of you who like to tweet I made a little hashtag for us, USU Flips. All right, here we go. I'd like you to take a minute and read this definition and talk, to, talk about it with your partner. What do you think it means? What do you like? What do you dislike? All right, talk to me about this definition. What, it, what do you like about it? What do you not like about it? Tell me what you've been talking about, yes. Uh, we're not sure about short video lectures being the only thing that students have to do outside of classes. Okay, so we're not sure about it just being short video lectures. A lot of you are nodding. Okay, thank you. What else? Anybody agree with that? Saw some nodding Definitely. here. Definitely. It's not just about video lectures. What else? In my flipped class that is going on now, my students don't always necessarily want to have the material delivered to them, and then they come into class and use it. Some of them like to learn to swim by drowning and just go into the classroom, learn it, and then go home and watch the okay. presentation. They're practical learners. Okay. So the, the time frame there should be adjusted according to the student. Are you flipping the flip? What are you I, doing I, there? I, 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 <laughs> well, you can on both sides if you flip it twice. And you're absolutely right. There you go. Flip it, flip it. It's done. It's totally done at that point. All right. Good. Okay. Yes. I saw you raise your hand. Um, I've been in plenty of situations where students are using the Whoever's speaking, we can't hear you. Are you? Do you have a mic that you could get closer to? 
If uh, you're going to speak in this room, we have ceiling mics. If we could just ask you to speak with your outside voice. Outside voices. Okay, I will repeat the question because it's the number one most frequently asked question that I hear no matter where I go, which is what do you do if students don't come to class prepared? What if they don't watch the video, they don't do the reading, they don't do the worksheet, they don't listen to the podcast? What did? Have some strategies for you today that we'll share. Also, have a free white paper that I'll give you at the end of. I'll give you the link to it at the end of the workshop, which will be ten strategies you can think about there. I will say this before we jump into it: that, um, and I wrote about this a little bit. One of my mentors, Rich Felder, he's an engineering professor at North Carolina State University. He's retired now. He says that whenever you put students into an active learning environment, like a flipped classroom, they actually go through something similar to the stages of grief. So first, they're like, oh, I can't believe this. I can't believe this is happening. We're te she, he's not teaching. He's not in front of the class. What? Shock. Total shock. Then there's denial. I can't do this. I can't believe this. I don't, um, this is not for me. Then there could be isolation. I don't really want to work with the group. Can I just turn in an alternative assignment? There's some bargaining going on there. Eventually, we want to get them to a place of acceptance. Okay? But it's very interesting. We need to think about where are our students on that journey? It's a little more complicated than just we didn't do it. There might be something else going on there. All right, let's look at this. This definition came from EDUCALS in 2012. So um, right when the flipped classroom terminology was starting to take off, this definition came out. And I see a lot of pushback on that short video lecture piece. So you picked up on absolutely the right thing. All right, how about this one? Okay, what do you think? You can just talk to me. I'm not that scary. I had an interest. This is Cynthia in Moab. I had an interesting comment um, on one of my teacher evaluations because this is exactly what I try to do. I love this definition. And I teach business classes. And one of the students accused me of being very unprofessional. And I think it's because that student's expectation is that I would be the more traditional sage on the stage, subject matter expert delivering content. And the flipping method allows me to be much more relaxed and interactive and engaging with the students, almost conversational. And I think that's what this particular student was reacting to. So I think it, it strikes different students in different ways. And I'm really hoping he was a minority or she. Great comment. So, you know, one of the quotes that I always say is just like you are learning how to teach this way, your students have to learn how to learn this way. It is new. It is not the same as going in, listening to a lecture, taking notes, spitting it out on a test. So we have to support our students through that journey. We have to think about how do we introduce it to them on the first day? How do we sustain that? How do we hold them accountable? How do we keep our expectations high? We have to think about all of that. Now, part of that we're going to discuss as we go through our lesson plan step by step, and that might can address some of those. But yeah, absolutely. You know, um, students come in with, with an idea of what kind of learning experience they're going to have. Um, I've had students totally turn away and walk out of a classroom that doesn't look like a lecture hall. Like, wow, I'm, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay. Or if you call it a flipped classroom, I always advise faculty don't call your class a flipped classroom. Just say, this is how I teach. And the reason is because flipped, the term flipped classroom brings a lot of baggage with it. Some students have had really good experiences, some students have had really bad experiences. And some students have had experiences in K 12 settings, especially in high school right now, that doesn't match what you're trying to do at the higher education level. So don't, don't name it, just do it. Okay. Speaking of high school, Bergman and Sams are two high school teachers, two high school science and chemistry teachers. And they came up with this definition. Thoughts about this one? You liked this one. I forgot your name. You said you like this definition. It's a model of what you do. That's more of a philosophy, maybe. This one doesn't seem Yes, it was Cynthia. Yes. Okay. Um, in, in my classroom, I found that it's actually the focus. I find students helping each other learn which they actually really enjoy, and yet they still look to me as the authority figure, but they tell me they're learning so much because they got confused on the reading, they help each other, then we come together, and they still look to me as the authority, if that makes sense, for the final word, but they say they are getting to know it a lot better than they did when they read it on their own. Okay, good. So in that case, it's all about that student-to-student -student interaction, not just teacher-to-student. Excellent. Okay, so for me, 
I was trying to think about what does all this mean, so seven years ago I created an acronym before the flipped classroom was ever even a thing. I came up with this. It's based on my teaching philosophy, actually. So for me, it means to focus on your learners by involving them in the process. What process? I want you to involve them in the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. Everybody heard of Bloom's taxonomy? Yep, we've seen it before. Yep. So for me, when I think about a lecture, when you think about your lecture, typically your students would be doing most of the remembering or understanding. Maybe they would apply if you have them work a problem, right? Then you send them outside of class to go do the heavy lifting. That's where they have to write those papers, solve those problems, do the homework, create the presentation, do a poster, whatever it is. So with the flip, for me, I'm trying to help you think about your course material in a little bit different way. It's not about putting boring stuff online, right? It's not about trying to replicate what you would do in class online. It's about trying to move the lower level learning outside of class so that you can free up time in class for the higher level stuff. That's where students need your help. Right? When they're doing the analyzing, the comparing, the evaluating, the synthesizing that article, the trying to figure it out, that's when they need your help. So this is the model that I use. Okay? Some of you mentioned this before. I think I heard this moving from the sage on the stage. When you get ready to write your lesson plan, I want you to think of one question. Instead of going into it saying, what am I going to go in class and talk about? I want you to say, what are students going to do? What are they going to do? Whenever I plan a faculty development workshop, I say, what are faculty going to do? Okay, you're going to do a lesson plan, all right? So I want you right now to start thinking about a lesson. Preferably a lesson you would teach in maybe a week. You can pare it down if you want, maybe two days. Teach a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. It might be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But I don't want you to get too big. This is not a whole unit, okay? The smaller you can get, the better. All right, does everybody have something in mind? All right. So think about that. I'm going to give you some strategies for what you should flip in your class if you're not quite sure. Right, I call these flippable moments, and there are three of them. Look at your course, look at your lesson, and here's the three places you want to look to find something you should flip. Look for confusion. Are your students confused? They keep missing the quiz questions. Have you seen it repeatedly missed on the midterms and the final? That is the place that needs to be flipped. Whatever that unit is, something's happening there, and it's not connecting with the student. So confusion. Number two, look for the fundamentals. So if your students are missing some of the fundamental information in the class, they certainly aren't going to be able to apply and analyze it. Okay, So that might be worth flipping. Maybe you need to do some kind of activity around the fundamentals. And last but not least, look for boredom. I don't just mean students falling asleep. I also mean your boredom. Okay, If you've taught this thing for the last 12 semesters and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't possibly think about teaching this theory again, it's time to flip it. Okay. Because your students are going to pick up on that. Okay. All right, so what are the three, th three uh, flippable moments? What's the first one? What's the second one? Third one? Boredom. All right. Does anybody have something in their lesson or in their course that meets all three? Because if you do, you need to flip that. <laughs> okay? You really need to flip. You really need to work on tweaking that. All right? So here we go, we're going to design a flip lesson. I'm going to try to walk around and help as many people as I can, give you a lot of ideas. This is a great place for you to think and collaborate and brainstorm, all right? So if you will open your packet, and those of you who don't have a packet, you can download it straight from my website here. Um, also, after the workshop, I will make sure to get packets to everyone who attended. And they're free. You can just download them for free. Okay, so the first thing I'd like you to do on your packet, and if you don't have the packet, you can just sketch this out on the scrap sheet of paper, okay, is I want you to identify the topic and the purpose of the lesson you want to flip. Okay, what's your topic, math, what's your lesson, X, Y, Z theory. The more specific you can get, the better. All right, we're going to move to the next phase just because of time. All right, so the next big section that you're going to do, and this is where I'm going to come around and try to help as many as I can, is you're going to write specific learning outcomes for each level of Bloom's taxonomy for your lesson. Okay, and just to recap here, for some of you it might be new to think about learning outcomes, when you write one, it should always start with the words that students will be able to. If you're flipping a faculty development workshop, it's faculty will be able to. Okay, students will be able to. Then you ask yourself, is it specific? Is it measurable? And can your students show it to you? If they cannot show it to you, you need to rewrite it. Okay? So 
You don't want to write things like students will be able to understand or know or appreciate. Students will appreciate the value of math. We don't know what that looks like, okay? So you want to get very specific what the students need to be able to do. And to help you with this, I've given you a sort of a cheat sheet on the back of that that has a whole bunch of verbs from Bloom's Taxonomy. Um, but what I want to do is to walk you through an example course. Does anybody in here teach healthy cooking? Excellent. Okay, I always try to pick a topic that nobody teaches because I want you to step away from your area of expertise and I want you to really focus on how this works. All right, so our course today is Healthy Cooking 101. Our topic is addressing childhood obesity, the healthy lunch box. All right, so the goal of my assignment is students will be able to create a healthy version of the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Everybody got it? Okay, can we see that? Can students show us that? Yes, they can create a sandwich and show it to us so we can see that. It's a good learning outcome. All right, so if I were going to write a learning outcome at each level of Bloom's Taxonomy, and this is what you're getting ready to do on your own, um, I combine mine, you're going to write each of yours out separately. I just did mine to say real estate. So for the remembering, it would be students will be able to list the ingredients in a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. All right, everybody, what are the ingredients? Bread. Peanut butter. Peanut butter. Yeah. Jelly. Jelly. Oh, jet, jet, jet. <laughs> All right. Now students will be able to describe the ingredients. Okay, so maybe you have them explaining what, what is peanut butter, what is jelly, what types of bread. Okay. As we work our way up Bloom's Taxonomy, example of applying, would students will be able to use a nutrition label for each of the ingredients to compare the different types of bread, peanut butter, and jelly. All right, so how many different types of bread are there? Give me one. Whole wheat. Whole wheat. White. White. Multigrain. Multigrain. Multi Rye. Multi Rye. Chiba. Say that one again. Chiba. Chiba. Ah, oh, yes, that one is very good bit, actually. Mm -hmm. What about wraps? Why do we have to do bread? Okay. All right, what about peanut butter? How many different kinds of peanut butter are there? Crunchy? Creamy? Creamy? Extra crunchy. Extra, extra, extra crunchy. Okay. What else? Organic. Organic. Roasted. Say it again. Roasted. Roasted peanut butter. What if I'm allergic to peanuts? Oh, oh almond butter. Okay, cashew butter. All right, and what about jelly? Pick a fruit. Pick a fruit. There's a jelly, right? So what I'm trying to get you to see is all of a sudden our simple little learning outcome the students will be able to create a peanut butter and jelly sandwich just got really complicated. And this is just peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So your discipline and your, your topic can get more complicated than you think really quickly. And that's why a lot of students get frustrated and they don't do the pre-class work. They're not sure what to do. All right, let's look at the last two. Students will rank the healthiest types of ingredients. And then students will create a healthy peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Maybe there's a rubric. Maybe they taste test it, whatever, all right? So that is what you're going to do with your worksheet. Right now, we're going to take the next probably 10 to 12 minutes and actually try to walk through the whole lesson. Please remember to try to keep in mind that you don't want to use this kind of language, develop an appreciation of, understand, learn about. You want to try to get very, very specific with each level of work. All right, so if you need another example, here's one that I walked through. Students will be able to design a poster for a local hospital explaining how heart disease damages a healthy heart. So you can see they can start at the bottom by just identifying the chambers. They can explain how blood flows. They can draw the process. They can compare healthy tissue to disease tissue. They can select the top three most convincing facts about it. And they can design a poster. And it's just an example. Right, I'm going to leave that example up while you do this for your class. Try to go through all six levels of Bloom's taxonomy for your lesson. Okay? All right, how are we doing? We okay? Has everybody had a chance to walk through all six? Yes? Okay. I will come around and keep working with you. We had some good brainstorming over here on this side, so I'll keep working with you. Uh, the next thing that we're going to actually do is to outline your lesson plan. So the first thing I want to ask, though, is was that a little bit challenging? Yes? For some of you, it was like, oh, it's a little bit challenging. Why do you think it was challenging? Tell you why. I'll give you the answer. Okay. I'll give you the answer. The answer is because we all suffer from something. You all suffer from this. I suffer from this. It's called the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge. Um, 
The curse of knowledge is when you know something so well that you cannot possibly remember what it's like to not know it. You need to put your, your, yourself into the role of a novice, but you are an expert. And so it's really difficult to do that. So whenever you're stuck and you just don't feel like you're really connecting with students or you feel like you're going over their head or they're just failing the, the quizzes time and time and time again, you need to step back and say, okay, clearly I'm not making this clear enough for my students. It might be helpful to walk through Bloom's Taxonomy for whatever it is you're doing and unpack it because it forces you to step back and think, oh, okay, I forgot. They don't even know the definitions of this thing, right? And you've been studying it for 30 years. So that's what it's called, the curse of knowledge. It makes it really difficult for you to not know what it's like to, to know what it's like to not know as a student. It's very difficult to think like a novice again once you've been doing this day in and day out, okay? So that's why I have you go through each step, okay? And some of you I saw, even here, we were, I was, as I was helping, some of you jumped immediately to like analysis or evaluation because that's, you already know the basics, but your students don't, okay? All right, so next we're going to outline the lesson plan. So that's the next page over. This is the one we're actually going to go through and bring these learning outcomes to life and start to address how we actually do this in class. Because you have a great list of outcomes, but how are you going to make them happen? All right, so very first thing you're going to do is to write, just literally move over your purpose statement like I have here. I have students will be able to create a healthy peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So what is your ultimate goal that students are going to be able to do? It should be a higher level of Bloom's taxonomy. Okay, so you're probably going to want to move over that top level, the create level. Okay, so you're literally just sort of copy and paste them. I've given you the example in the workbook as well. Level this this uh, topic of the lesson is it important to attempt to include as much of the actual knowledge attention that you're assuming within that because to create a healthy PB and J we talked about they're learning all of the steps up to it that just by that statement you're assuming that that's included how yes. detailed do you need you don't need to get that purpose statement that detailed that's your ultimate outcome of this lesson whatever it is create a uh, you know, uh, create a case, create a poster, analyze something, you know, that's fine. It's fine at this level to do that because you're going to break it down as we unpack the rest of the lesson plan. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's really to keep you focused because I can't tell you how many times I've seen faculty write their learning outcome. Students will be able to create a healthy peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then when we start working down the basics, they write themselves into something completely different. They get fully off track. All of a sudden, we are creating a pizza. Right? So this helps you stay focused on your goal. The other thing this will help you do is to figure out whether or not this lesson is worth flipping. So when you go through the motions, you're like, why am I going through all this? doesn't matter. That's why it's important to think back to the flippable moments. Because you, you want to flip something that matters. Because I know that you're all short on time. I know you have other responsibilities. That's why you want to make sure when you flip something, it's worth it. Okay? I'm not saying flip everything. All right. Okay, so you got your purpose. Yep. All right, we're literally moving along. All right, it's going to be some copy and pasting here as well. So you're going to go to the prior to class section. This is where you want to grab the first two levels of your learning outcomes. Okay, the list, describe, define, identify, explain. Those learning outcomes, we want to focus and try to move those outside of class time. We don't want to waste time in class doing that. We want those to be outside of class. So you're going to literally copy and paste it over. Mine is list and describe each of the ingredients I need to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I decided that if we're going to be talking about nutrition labels, I needed them to know the parts of a nutrition label. So that's important. The second part of this is what are they going to do? How are they going to meet these learning outcomes? So for me, they're going to watch a video of a chef making a sandwich. They're going to post their own descriptions and experiences of eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then they're going to describe this on the discussion board. And then maybe they're going to take their phones and snap a, a picture of a nutrition label and scan it up on the discussion board, okay? Can I see a student do those things? Can I measure that? Yep. Can I grade that if I wanted to? 
This is critical. If you want students to do the pre-class work, you got to give them something that is visible, tangible, specific, measurable, and something that you can grade. Okay? That's very important. I'll tell you a story. If you just say, hey, I want my students to read chapter two. Yep. I teach a graduate course at NC State University sometimes. Graduate course. I just one particular time that I taught this course, there were 15 graduate students in the room. These are all PhD students, PhD students. And I gave them a lesson, I mean, I did, uh, an assignment prior to the first day of class. I said, I want you to read chapter one. Come to class, ready to talk about it. That's all I said, read chapter one. So I go to class, first day of class. I said, okay, I grabbed a marker and I went to the whiteboard and I said, all right, I'm gonna go around the room and I want you to tell me how you read. It's like, John, how did you read? John said, well, I like to outline the chapter as I read. So I wrote, outline the chapter. Which the next person was like, Mary, Mary, what did you do? And she said, well, I could only really read the, the bold font. Didn't have a lot of time. So I wrote, read the bold font. Went to the next student, Steve, what did you do? Steve, how did you read? He said, well, I like to just look at the questions at the end of the chapter, and then I like to see if I can find the answer. Okay, so I wrote that down. I went around, and all 15 students had a different way that they approached read. What did I mean? Did I want them to outline? Did I want them to define? Did I want them to be able to answer questions? What, was, what, what did I want them to do? I didn't say. So they all came with a different level of knowledge and expertise. And so that is one of the reasons why it can hinder your flipped classroom. Just do something as simple as read or watch a video. You've got to give them an extra step. So notice that I have watch a video and post this to the discussion board. Then I can go in and grade that if need be. Okay. I will say it's important to start strict, and then you can let up over time. So I would start by grading. I'd start by reviewing as much as you can, and that sets the standard and the expectations. All right. But one of the first places that you can fail with the flipped classroom is not defining what it is you want students to be able to do prior to coming to class. All right. So get specific. Questions, comments. This is kind of addressing your question. We're getting to that. How can I get students to come to class prepared? This is one of the ways. Okay, all right, go for it. You come up with uh, your learning outcomes and then how are they gonna do it? Let's see the next part. So the next part is called a focusing activity. All right, so this is another way you get students to do the work and come to class prepared called a focusing activity. A focusing activity is something you do in the first three to five minutes of class. Okay? Focusing activity is designed to not only assess whether or not the students did the pre-class work, but it also helps them bridge their pre-class work or their prior to class work to what you're going to do in class. They could have done their pre-class homework a week ago and forgot about it. And then you have them come to class and it's like, well, now I want you to talk about what you did for pre-class work. And they're like, well, that was seven days ago. So this helps them bridge that connection, okay? It also helps students, and this is, I think, is very, very important, see the value of pre-class work, okay? If students don't see the value of why they're spending this time doing the reading, watching the video, listening to the podcast, they're not gonna do it anymore, okay? They have gotta see the value. So a, pre, uh, a focusing activity is designed to, right when they walk in the room, focuses their attention right on whatever the topic is of the day. Now, uh, after the introduction of me an hour ago, what did I use as my focusing activity? You're like, oh, that was an hour ago, Barbie, serious. What was it? The characteristics, right? That was my opening slide. My opening slide was not about me. And had I not been in a formal situation where I was introduced, if you were my students, that would have been your opening slide. And right when you come in, you're like, oh, we're talking about flipped classroom today. And you're focused right from the start. Okay? There's so many things you can do for this. You can show a picture. You can show a diagram. You can show data. You can show a comment. You can show a video clip. You can show a timeline. You can do a quote. You can have a model sitting on the desk, what you're talking about today. You can do a demonstration. You can do a clicker question. You can do a quiz. There's so much you can do here. So I would like you to think of one focusing activity you could do that your students will do to bridge the pre-class work with their in-class work. Five minutes or less is what it should take. Quick. Mine is students will complete a quiz. 
based on the, the video and the discussion board. Maybe it's three to five questions. Okay? What are your students going to do? Go ahead and plan something. Again, it can be quick. It can take 30 seconds. All right, we're moving on. All right, this is the fun part, and this is the part that you're not going to be able to flesh out because we only have an hour and a half today. If you had three hours, we would really expand on this. But this is this would be your homework, all right? So what are your students going to do in class? Now, this is the magic of the flip, all right? You've already had, you've already put content pre-class, okay? And then they come to class, and they're going to do a focusing activity, and now what? Okay, do not repeat whatever you did in the pre-class work. If that was a video of a lecture, do not repeat the lecture. Don't go back over the same concepts, or they will never do your pre-class work again. Okay? <laughs> so you got to focus. you gotta, you got you to know what you're going to do when they walk in. So what are some things students are going to do? So you look at your next levels of Bloom's taxonomy. What are they applying? What are they analyzing? What are they evaluating? What are they creating? You're going to do that in class. That's your class time. This is the true definition of your role shifting from the lecturer to the coach. From the stage on the stage to the guide inside. Okay, and you're going to feel that shift in the classroom immediately. All right, so we're your students. Okay, so what are they going to do? My students are going to use nutrition labels to compare the different types of bread, peanut butter, and jelly. Now just pick today one of your learning outcomes. You don't have to go through all of them. Just pick one to play with, right? And what my students are going to do is they're going to work in small groups and compare different nutrition labels for each of the ingredients. So if you were to walk into my class, I might have tables set up with the nutrition labels on each table for different types of bread, peanut butter, and jelly. And then maybe we have a rubric, and then students are working in groups and they're analyzing the nutrition label against the rubric and they're comparing which one has the less fat, less salt, less sodium, less sugar. What does it matter? What if it has less sugar, more fat? And they're analyzing all of that. That would be my classroom. If you were to observe it, that would be what was happening. And then I'm walking around working on each of the groups. That is not lecturing. Yes? You're more successful when you allow them to form their own groups, or you put them in groups at the beginning of the semester and say, get to know these people and stay with them. Every time I put you in a group, you find those six people. All right, so group management strategies. Yeah, that could be a whole separate workshop. But um, I think to mix it up. So I think it depends on your goal, first of all. If you have students working towards a, a final project together, then of course you want to form that group early, and you may want to form that group yourself um, to avoid the student clicks and those kinds of things. I'm not sure what you teach, but if they move through um, your discipline at the same time, they're going to form those groups, and you might want to bust that up a little bit. Um, if they're not working towards some final goal, then I say mix it up each time, and they can get to know other students in the class. So it just really depends on your, your strategy. There's pros and cons to all. So, um, but for, in this case, it could be just students are working in groups at their tables. And next week we might mix it up. Because it's not leading to a project. Okay, so your turn. Pick one of your higher level learning outcomes and think, what would this look like in my class if students were doing it? What would they be doing? Are they working in groups or pairs or teams? Are they writing at a computer? Are they at a lab? Are they performing some experiment? What, what are they doing? Get one thing outlined. Yes. Okay, we have a question if everybody wants to hear. I can't properly lab, but I'll try and find an individual. So we have these like three or four that get different things. You said to only do one, but then I thought about them. So each one of the higher objectives that we have, would we do that in one class period or could we do them all in one class period? I would think it would be so the question is when you're doing the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, do you do you do them all in one class period or do you do them like each class period? So Here's my answer to that. First, I'm going to back up. I think it is too much to do Bloom's taxonomy from the very beginning if they've never seen the concept before, never been introduced to it before except for the pre-class, and you're trying to take them all the way. That might be a little much. Like, you might want to stop at, like, apply for one class, and then the next class pick it up and go a little higher. So it's not to say that they can't create something, like create questions or create a, a, a diagram. Like, that's easy for them to do. But if, if you don't want to take them too far, burn it. Right, so um, I think in answering this question, it just depends on when you introduce them to the topic. So you're introducing them to new terminology and um, uh, 
lots of definitions, if I remember correctly. And so you want to give them time to kind of digest those before they move on. Okay. So it might be two lessons, but it, it really just depends. It also depends on the time, like how long of a class you teach. So some of you might teach a three-hour block. I mean, you could do, do the whole thing, but some of you might teach 50 minutes and then you may not. Okay, good questions. Yes? This might be a bit pessimistic, but <laughs> uh, I, I teach a skill-based class in a lab setting, and I, I feel, you mentioned earlier the curse of knowledge, that I, I catch myself sometimes wanting to just infuse them with everything I know, and how do you, when you start adding on, you have this activity to gain this, and this activity to that, and this interaction to get this, the workload just builds and builds and builds, and a lot of my students are lazy. So if I overload them with all these options that you can learn in all of these ways, they feel like I'm giving them way too much, and then they put up a wall. Okay. How do you overcome that? All right, so student resistance. That's the, that's the question, student resistance. Students push back in a lot of ways. It could be laziness. It could be something else, okay? So I'll go all the way back to that stage of grief. There could be something else going on. I've never seen this before. This is new. I resist. I don't know my role in this space. I don't know how I'm going to be assessed if we're always doing group work. I don't like this. Um, it's uh, You're supposed to be the teacher in the front of the room, and I don't know. I don't, I don't pay for my colleagues to teach me. I pay you to teach me. That is a, That comes a lot. So there's a lot going on with resistance. Sometimes it's laziness, but sometimes it is not. Sometimes there's something else there. So I encourage you to think about that a little more. Like try to find out really what it is going on with your students. It could be they don't have time. They have families. They have full-time jobs. There really may not be time. So a lot of this is talking with the students and figuring out how much they can handle for the pre-class work. Okay? If you're having them do too much pre-class work, they're not going to do anything. They're just going to shut it down. And that's where you're going to get that perception of laziness or they're not prepared ever. Okay, there might be something going on. You need to tweak your pre-class assignment. With the in-class work, we're not adding more. We're just doing it a different way. Okay, so I can cover the same, if not more, mat material and content. I'm just now doing it through group projects or group work or analyzing or using a case study or whatever that may be. I'm just doing it in a different format. Okay. It may get the perception of we're doing too much, and then you may have to back off if you know your students really well. Maybe you're doing too many activities. This goes to, and it's controversial, to learning styles and preferences. Some students just can't handle activity, 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 activity. Like, I need time to stop and reflect. And maybe you need to build in some reflection and quiet time into your class. That's okay. Okay? You don't want to go full-scale activity for every single thing you do. Okay? So you might have to find some balance. Does that help? Okay, so um, yeah, I wrote some articles on uh, the introvert in the in the flipped classroom because it can be a very overwhelming place. Um, it would not just need time to think and process. And so you want to make sure, just like today, I've tried to model for you a lot of these strategies. There's a lot of individual work time, and then there's some group time, and then there's some more individual time. You may have to do something like that. Okay, good question. Yes, before we move on, all right, let's wrap up this lesson. All right, let's wrap it up. Okay, so your students, they did some pre-class work. They did a focusing activity. They came to class and they did some more activities, some reflection, some writing, whatever it is you have them doing. And now it's time for class to end. Now, it is very important in your flipped classroom for you to come up with some kind of ending. Because I could have this group working through a problem and they're moving faster than that group and this group hasn't even gotten to the problem yet and this group over here is still working on the video and they're all in different places. So you've got to bring them back together and focus them at the end. Okay, so you got to come up with a closing, some kind of, something other than, that was great, see you Thursday. Okay, <laughs> something that really focuses them on what we just did. I like to use what's called my so what, now what question. So what, now what? So when I was in graduate school, I wrote a dissertation, and back then they were hard copy dissertations, which is really nice because you can see your work, right? <laughs> and I took it to my chair, my committee, and I gave it to him. I said, so I finished my dissertation. He said, so what, Barbie? I said, so what? Now you're going to call me doctor. Just saying. <laughs> it was this follow-up question that was sort of life-changing. He said, so what? You finished your dissertation. So what? You got a PhD. Now what? Now what? So this is my so what, now what question for you. So what? Your students were in class with you for the last 50 minutes. Now what? What's the next step? What can they do that sets them up for the next lesson? 
What can they do that sets them up for the next pre-class work? What can they do that extends the learning beyond the scope of class? Could they go interview someone in the field? Could they watch the news that night because it's related to crime stories that relates to a topic in your class or the political situation? Could they sit on a reflection question and submit it on the board and then that becomes the pre-class work for the next class? I don't know. What could you do? How can you end class and continue to learn? So for me, I have students vote on the healthiest ingredients. Then they leave class and they go interview three people about their preferences for the types of peanut butter, bread, and jelly. So then maybe my focusing activity next class is they're going to share those interviews, what they found out from the interviews. Okay, see how that works? Met and see next class. Okay, you don't have to make it that complicated. It could just be everybody pay attention to me. I need to just review. Here's our learning outcomes. Which of these are you still confused about? Let everybody raise their hand. You fill in some information and then you send them on their way. That's fine. But if you want to continue to learn and try to so what now? What question? Okay, all right, your turn. Try it. How are you going to end class? How are you going to end class? Okay, let's, let's come back together. Does everybody have some kind of closing activity? Some kind of closing? This group is awesome. All right, here we go. We're going to finish this up with an activity. This is my closing activity. What I'd like you to do is look in your packet, flip it over, and you should see a little pink, a, a bingo card. It looks like this little tic-tac-toe grid. All right, this is my assessment game to see how we did. Okay? So what I would like you to do is I'm going to give you these eight questions, there's nine questions, I'm sorry, there's nine questions here. I want you to answer any eight of these nine questions. Now, you can work in partners with this, okay? So you can work in pairs. You don't have to work alone. And you just need one card per pair. So not everybody has to fill out a card. All right, so you're going to answer any of these questions. Now, when you, what you're going to do here is when you answer a question, say that question to number three is true. I might write number three and true in my upper corner, but this group might decide to write number three and true down here. That's fine. Okay, you get to decide how to design your card. Okay, maybe the answer to number one is Bloom's Taxonomy, and I'll write it here. Maybe that group decides Bloom's Taxonomy, but they want to write it here. I don't care. Okay, you fill it in any way you want. Okay, everybody understand the task? All right, so one card per pair or group, and here are your questions. Try not to look at your notes. Okay, does everybody have their card filled out? Yep, 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 yep. We're going to play. Okay, my remote people, you're still playing, and if you win the game, uh, we'll ship the books to you. And let me just say that right now, the prize, first I guess I better go over the rules. These are the rules. I'm going to randomly read a question out of my little bag here. Okay, I have all nine questions in my little bag. Uh, when I read that question, if you have the answer to that question, you're going to place a piece of candy or, or the candy wrapper. <laughs> on your part. So right now everybody can place a piece of candy on their free space. My remote people, if you don't have a piece of candy, you can use a piece of paper or a paper clip or any kind of office supply tool and mark that. All right? So everybody can place a piece of candy on the free space. All right, your goal is to get either three pieces of candy up and down, side to side, or diagonal. Okay, faculty, we're not inventing like four corners or anything like that. Okay, just stick to the basics, okay? First team to yell bingo, I'm going to come and I'm going to check your answers, make sure they are correct, then you win your choice. Here's what we have. These are my books. This one is 50 focusing activities for your class. Okay, so those of you who need more ideas. This one is 101 unplugged flip strategies. So if you're looking for things to do that don't use technology, just looking for some new ways to mix it up with like sticky notes and index cards and things like that, here's 101 ideas. This one's 101 ways to flip. Uses technology, not technology, uses all kinds of ideas. And the last one is 101 ways to flip your online class. So if you teach online, there's ways to engage students online. All right, you win your choice of book. Got it? All right, here we go. Is everybody ready? You've never paid more attention to me than right now. <laughs> all right, here we go. Question number seven. What is your facilitator's name? If you have the answer, just place it over the square. I didn't wear a name tag either, so. All right. 
Question number five, true or false? You should begin. Bingo. 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 I got a bingo? I got a bingo. Got it too? Okay, hang on. I, um, can you show me what you, give me your answers to your questions? Okay, the answer to number seven is Barbie Honeycutt. Yep. Yep. And the answer to number five is false. Excellent. Okay. Can, you got it. So let me know which book you want. Can you record that for me? Just so we know who to ship it to. Uh, can we get that first book? We liked the very first one. Yeah, thank you. Just the first five minutes. Well, can you make a note for me to who to ship that to? Right? Yeah. Jen. Evers at USU Moab Regional Campus. Thank you. Jen, uh, you got I'll read it. Evers. If somebody has it, I just need somebody to read it for me. Okay. I'm sure about it. All right, let me check this next one. Sit tight, sit tight. Because I got plenty of books to go around. Okay. Yeah. All right, good. Let me know which book. Did you work together? Okay, which books do you want? Yeah. 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 Honey well instead of honey pot. No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it's just like it's just, okay. You didn't specify first and last. Yeah, you did. I did not. Oh, yeah. We just we put Barbie. You got to be specific here. about the outcome. <laughs> 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 You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, let me check the last one. Sit tight. Sit tight. Sit tight. Did I get some more up here? Yes. It could be first or last, or but it's got to be. I'll take the first. Yeah, I'll take the first. Yes. So that and that. All right, you pick. All right, you both get one. Uh huh. Yeah. All right, I think we might. All right, do you have anybody else? I did. That might be all my books. So I thought we get to play another round, but I don't have 100 books with me. So while I'm doing this, check your answers. Man, y'all are quick. I don't think I've ever done it in just two. Jeez. Okay. Yep. And you got it. Okay. This is what I have left. So you can all pick one. The only one I don't have here is the unplug. Okay, you got it. All right, how do we do? Was there something you did not know? Was there a confusing question besides my name? Seriously. Anything confusing? No? No? All right, we did pretty good. All right, let's debrief this before we go. What was the purpose of my game? Focusing? <laughs> Candy? Absolutely. Assessment for who? Uh, and and me. Absolutely. One time I missed a question completely, did not even talk about it. So, yeah, that went over real well. <laughs> um, okay, what else? Purpose. Stadium. This is so what now? What question it could be? Because now you can go use it in your class if you want. Um, how did our learning environment change when I introduced the game? It was fun. You weren't having fun the last hour and a half? Yeah, it's, it was it's serious fun. before. You know, this is serious. We're doing this lesson plan. This mixes it up. Absolutely. What else? How did it change? Engagement, some competition. Yeah. What I hope you felt was the shift in the room that you weren't all looking at me. I don't even think you paid attention to me until I gave you candy. Um, because you were so focused on creating your card. You were focused on filling out the little the spots. You're like, did we get this? And, and it was all about you. And that is a flip. That's what you want to try to create for your students. I just created it in the context of a game. But anytime you can flip it to your students, don't make it about you. Make it about them and what they're doing and analyzing and solving and filling out. That's the flip. I just want you to feel it in a different way. And feel free to use the bingo game. Easy to play. Just need some candy. All right, so the last piece of advice I want to give you before you head out, and I've put some articles in your packet, have a lot of articles on my blog as well to support you through this journey. But 
Whenever you are changing your, your role in the flipped classroom, it's moving from what I call being in high control to letting go. And this might be the hardest thing to be able to do. Because when you're lecturing, you're in control of the pace. You know what slide is coming next. You can probably anticipate the students' questions. You know probably when they're going to come. You know when you're going to pause. You know we're going to end. You know where you should be at a certain hour. When you flip it, you don't have that kind of control anymore. You still have control of the class, but it's going to feel very different. The student might ask a question totally out of left field. You've got to be ready to go there, right? Student may be totally defensive and like, I'm not going to participate. Then what? Right? You keep going. You need to be able to just, I call it being actively passive. I have worked very hard today to try to run around and talk with you, running up and down the stairs and moving all around. So you work hard, it's just in a different way. You're not delivering the lecture. Okay, so that's why I call it being actively passive, just stepping back um, from being in control. And last but not least, why in the world would you flip? Why would you go through all of this work? And this is the reason I want to give you. It's called the forgetting curve. All right, we keep seeing this coming up over and over and over again in the literature, people who are doing the research out there on the flipped classroom. And the forgetting curve cites back to 1996, actually, but they, people keep revisiting it with the, in, with the flipped classroom. So here's what it says. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> that once somebody is introduced to content, within 30 minutes or so, with no review at all, they'll remember quite a bit of it, 80% or so. Okay? But over time, say a month from now, when it's time to assess their learning, if they haven't done any review at all, they're not going to retain very much. And you've probably seen this for students who try to cram for an exam. Okay, they just don't retain as much. With the flip, we're shifting that model up to the top because the students are constantly being exposed to material and they're being assessed in class. I actually call the flip assessment in action. I've been able to assess your learning today by walking around and looking at your learning outcomes and asking questions and you're sharing with me. You'll do the same thing with your students. When you do that, the retention rises. Okay? And so here's one, I, I shared this earlier with some of your colleagues. Um, one of the studies that came out recently in Mac math education, was a faculty member, she, she uh, taught two sections of the same course, and she had a flipped version and a non-flipped version, okay? In the flipped version, she taught it, you know, how we've been talking, sometimes she had videos, she had activities and those kinds of things. In her non-flipped version, she did it the same way she always did, lectures, problems on the board, didn't change anything. At the midpoint, her students are scoring about the same on their mid-semester exams, about the same. But on her final exam, her flipped students outperformed her non-flipped students by as much as one whole letter grade. It's the retention that makes it so powerful because students are working with it every single day, day in and day out. So that is what makes the flipped classroom so powerful right now, is the evidence is starting to show that, retention. All right, so before I open it up for any questions or you got to go, I'll just say here is the free white paper with the 10 strategies on how do you get students to do your pre-class work. We talked about some best practices today. You can go here, you can download it. This has 10 more strategies. I think I used one today, so you can get nine more if you want to grab that. All right, y'all are awesome. You can go to my store, get the books. Um, I can do a discount for you if you want to order bulk books or something, let me know. Uh, but other than that, it's been awesome working with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I had a great time. Thank you.